Now, how do we tell what's going on? We've got to look at this now from a very much more physics -y point of view. That was an introduction <coughs> to what crystal structures are like, the sorts of materials that are, that are out there. How are we going to tell how the atoms are uh, arranged with respect to one another? Well, there are various ways of doing it, actually, but one of the really big breakthroughs came with the development of X-ray diffraction. Uh, we've probably all held a piece of material up to a light and seen you know, a distribution of dots around the centre point. Most of you tried that with street lamps or whatever. <coughs> well, if you haven't tried it, it's a good thing to do. Uh, it's an interference effect caused by the regular warp and weft of you know, the handkerchief or whatever it is you're holding up. Uh, we can do exactly the same thing with the arrangement of atoms. If they're in a crystal, then they've got a regular arrangement. So it's just like the warp and weft of the cotton handkerchief. Right, it's in 3D, and the sizes are significantly uh, smaller. All right, we are talking, remember, about spacings <coughs> in the region of 10 to the minus 10 of a meter. So in order to get the same sort of effect, we have to have light going through that has that sort of wavelength. The wavelength, we're going to do a lot more of this next term with pH 025. All right, so <coughs> I'm afraid there's a sense in which I'm going to have to skip forward a little bit to talk through this part of, of this module. But if we can use light, if we can use photons of that sort of wavelength, so a wavelength that's comparable to the spacing between the atoms in our crystal, then we can get this interference effect, diffraction effect out the other side. So we're going to end up doing an experiment whereby we know what goes in to our material. We measure very, very carefully what comes out again. And from those two pieces of information, we can work out how the atoms in our crystal must have been arranged to produce this from this. Okay, now that's the essence of an X-ray diffraction experiment. And you're going to do some X-ray diffraction as you go through uh, the labs. Not this year, I think, but next year. Um, and again, this is, this is a piece of science that owes its development to uh, somebody in Germany uh, who worked on you know, the, the, the early basic physical processes of this. Uh, and then actually a father and son team uh, in the UK, uh, William and Lawrence Bray, uh, who did the first measurements of crystal structures, interpretation of the data to produce arrangements of atoms. Um, and as I say, they're able to do this because the wavelengths are in this region of 10 to the minus 10 of a meter, or thereabouts. And their arrangement, their experimental arrangement is relatively simple. Um, and it involves the sorts of things that we've already talked about at lower energies. So they're actually looking at electron transitions, or the results of electron transitions. So what are they doing? They're actually using uh, accelerating beams of electrons, exactly as we did in a gas discharge tube, although we were doing it at quite low voltages. Right? We were looking at a few, up to 10, 20 electron volts in the various examples we looked at in order to get up to the ionization potential uh, for the outermost electron. In this case, they're accelerating the electrons up to maybe 10 kilovolts, 10,000 electron volts. Completely different energy scale. So what happens there? Well, there are no transitions in our outermost electrons that correspond to 10 kilovolts. Right? Remember what we were looking at? We did some calculations for sodium. We did for hydrogen. We did for, what else did we do? Mercury. Right? None of those energy <coughs> regions were much beyond you know, 10, 15 electron volts, even for ionization. Now, what these electrons are doing now is causing excitations in the electrons closest to the nucleus. So the ones that are most tightly held by the positively charged protons in the nucleus. Right? And the energy scales for those electrons are now not a few electron volts, 
but a few tens of thousands of electron worlds. But the basic physics is exactly the same. All right, so instead of kicking off the outermost electron, these electrons are actually able to kick out one of the electrons right near the nucleus. Okay? Now, what happens now? We've got, we've got a vacancy, essentially, in our first shell around the nucleus. We need another electron. So what happens is that the electron in the next shell out makes a transition. It actually goes to fill that hole. <coughs> so it has to give off its excess energy to do that. So it gives off an energy associated with the difference between the innermost electron shell and the next one out. And that photon is in the tens of kilovolts region. So we have x-rays. We don't have visible light anymore or infrared or ultraviolet. We're right out into the x-ray region. All right, now there's a lot of other stuff given off as well because of course now we've got a gap in our second shell so an electron in the third shell drops in to fill that. We get another photon out but it's now much lower energy because the energy scale is going down as we get to the outermost electrons. And that process continues. We end up with an ion of our original atom um, and a whole string of photons that have been given off. But the only ones we're interested in are those first photons, the really energetic ones, the x rays. <coughs> so that's how this system works. And their, their machine and a lot of the, you know, the really basic X-ray diffraction kit that's around now and certainly the stuff you will use in the undergraduate labs will just have a lump of copper there. Copper was really, really useful because one of the side effects of hitting it with these energetic electrons is that it heats up a lot. There's a lot of thermal energy produced in this process as the electrons all relax back, tumble down to fill up the holes that are, that are being produced. And copper's, you know, really good at transporting heat. So you could cool it, basically, and stop it melting. So it had really, really useful advantage. Um, so you hit this thing with, the, with our really energetic electrons and what we get out are x-rays and a whole bunch of other photons as I say but it's only the x-ray part that will contribute to our experiment so here's our light that we can now shine into the crystal that we want to know the structure of and measure what comes out the other side of it All Right now we need to quickly go through a little bit of physics again as I say we're going to do this in huge detail next term so this will make perhaps more sense um, uh, in a couple of months time than it does now but hopefully there's enough in here to get a sense for what's going on you can always go to the recommended course textbook if you want to get a little bit more information all we've really got to do is to look at the condition for measuring um, a high intensity of x-rays coming out the other side. And what we're going to find is there's only a certain set of directions from our crystal where that will happen. So we've got x-rays coming in, we've got our crystal in, in, in somewhere in the middle, and then we've got a detector over here. And our detector will see, essentially, if we think of it as a camera, uh, we're going to see bright spots where lots of x-rays have been deviated to and in between very few x-rays have come out and that's what's going to give us our information so we we need to think about why we would get a bright spot well we get a bright spot because of something a phenomenon called constructive interference um, and that simply means that we've got two or more x-rays coming in a particular direction and the waves and the troughs of those waves are lined up with one another. So they add up essentially at our detector and produce a bright spot. Right? In between uh, these bright spots we're going to have conditions where the wave peak of one 
corresponds to the wave trough of another and they'll actually cancel out. Right? So we'll get no intensity of the detector, we'll get a dark space in other words. Um, and that's going to be what drives what, what's going on. So here's those two examples down here. Constructive interference where the waves essentially are in phase, they line <coughs> up. So we get something big at the other end. And in between, we get this situation where that out of phase um, trough lines up with peak, peak with trough, and we end up getting no intensity <coughs> out the other end. So if you like, like energy is conserved, we've simply redistributed it in space. The energy has disappeared from any bit of space where this condition holds and it's appearing again in a bit of space where that condition holds. Total energy is still the same. So on our photographic plate at the other side we've got bright areas and dark areas. Bright areas are where the x-rays have gone, the dark areas uh, have gone from Constructive interference, the dark areas are associated with destructive interference. Um, so, you know, just imagine this is just two atoms, right? Scattering our X rays. So, we're going to have certain directions where wave peaks line up. So, there and there, for instance, there, there, and there, wave peaks, wave troughs. And other directions like there, where we have a wave peak and a wave trough coinciding with one another. So we're going to have high intensity, nothing. Right? High intensity, nothing, high intensity. And we can add more atoms, we can get exactly the same sort of thing going on. The only angles at which directions coming out of our crystal <coughs> uh, at which we're going to get bright spots are those angles where we've got our waves in this constructive interference site. At all other angles, that's not true. So the intensity we measure will go down. So in pseudo 3D, this is what we've got. Our electrons coming in, hitting the copper target, x-rays coming out, which we have to tidy up a little bit <coughs> so we get rid of all these other photons we don't want. Um, and we get a nice narrow collimated beam of x-rays which hits our crystal and we get the diffraction effect so what I've shown you on the previous slide essentially taking place such that at particular angles and only at particular angles do we get these bright areas on our detector yeah I'm going to stop there we'll pick this up again tomorrow um, but I'll give you a little bit of time to go away and think about what we've done today Okay, so I'll see you then. Right, it, and the experiment is based around uh, a very clear knowledge of what's going into our sample and a very careful measurement of what comes out. Right? And where all these high intensity uh, locations are is where we've had the phenomenon you'll remember called constructive interference between the x-rays. So they bounced off the atoms uh, or the layers of atoms in our crystal and in particular directions, that means that wave crests and wave troughs will line up with one another and will get constructive interference. And in those particular directions, we will get high intensity on our detector, a spot, if you like. Um, and in other directions, we'll have the opposite. We'll have destructive interference. So we'll have wave peaks and wave troughs overlapping. We will end up with zero intensity. So this process of diffraction uh, has essentially redistributed energy in space. Right? So we've now got smaller amounts of energy in these places, larger amounts of energy in these. Total energy has been conserved, but we've redistributed it uh, through this process of diffraction. All right, now how do we move on from here? Um, what we're heading towards is a really famous equation in physics called the Bragg equation which comes from his, his father and son team I told you about uh, yesterday. Um, and the basic setup is as shown here. So here's our crystal. It's actually just the first two layers <coughs> of atoms in our crystal. So imagine this as a simple cubic structure, for instance. And we can regard these layers of atoms as acting a little bit like mirrors. Right? That's essentially the, the process that we're going to take our x-rays through. So we've got x-rays coming in from 
uh, our source wherever it is um, and now making this angle with the surface of our crystal, this angle theta. All right, these are parallel lines, these are parallel lines. So the trigonometry is going to become relatively uh, easy here. Um, and because we're treating these like mirrors, this angle of incidence here is going to be exactly the same as what is, in effect, an angle of reflection on the <coughs> other side. Classic mirror stuff. So some of our X-rays will come in and bounce off this top layer of atoms, right, back out again. Some will go through uh, the top layer but bounce off atoms in the second layer or the third layer or the fourth layer, whatever it might be, uh, and come back out again. Now remember, to get a high intensity, a bright spot over here in this direction, it must be the case that these two X-rays coming back out again are in phase their wave peaks and their wave troughs must be overlapping. Yeah? So that sets a condition for us. Because this X-ray look has travelled that distance. Whereas this one's gone all the way through the second layer and gone up here. So our second X-ray, if we look at it in this simplistic way, has actually travelled that much, A through B to C, that much extra. And the key to getting the Bragg equation is to say that this extra bit, this extra path length for our X-ray, must be the same as a whole number of X-ray wavelengths. Right? So we can move peaks wherever we like, provided we move them a whole number of wavelengths so they're still lined up with another set of peaks. So that's our condition. So all we've really got to do is to work out what the length of that bold dotted line is in the diagram. And that becomes basic um, trigonometry. right? Because we've got a right angle triangle that we can construct here. This angle has to be theta just because of the fact we're dealing with parallel lines here. Um, we know what the length of the triangle here is, it is the spacing between layers of atoms in the crystal, right? which I've labelled D on this diagram. So this is the hypotenuse of one of our right angle triangles. Here's AB drawn out down here. <coughs> yeah. Now it's that length that we're after. So that tells us immediately that we need to use the sine of this angle, right? which is AB over D. And we've got two of these lengths. We've got this one and this one, which are the same. So twice AB is what we're heading for um, in order to solve this problem. So our total path difference going A through B to C is the same as 2AB, as the triangles are the same, which is just twice D times sine theta. Right? Now, for that to have produced a bright spot on our detector at the other side, that length must be a whole number of X-ray wavelengths. <coughs> because we've still got to have, remember, our wave peaks and our wave troughs lining up. <coughs> so we can write this down in this form. Here's the wavelength of our X-rays, and we just multiply it by 1, 2, 3, 4, whatever. And this is the Bragg equation. This tells us that if we get a bright spot, if we know the wavelength of our X-rays, we've got a way now of beginning to calculate what the spacing between the layers of the atoms were, which is what we're heading towards. All right, now there's an important point here, which I want to emphasize, <coughs> something that goes wrong uh, in exams many times over. Let me sketch it up on the board. Let's assume we've got our layers of atoms in a <coughs> crystal like this. All right? And we've got X-rays coming in which, if they don't interact with anything, will just carry on. Right? It's what electromagnetic rays do. They travel in a straight line unless you do something to them. But if we had a, um, an atom here, say, then our X-ray might be reflected, uh, scattered back out again. 
So if this angle here is theta, then given that this is the intersection of two straight lines, that one also must be theta. Uh, which actually means, again, because we're talking about reflection, that one is theta. So our x-ray has changed <coughs> angle by two theta. Look. Okay, so keep that in mind. What you will measure in the experiment is this change, the total change in the direction of your <coughs> x-ray, which is 2 theta. What the equation is giving you is sine theta. So the very, very first thing you will do when faced with experimental data is to halve the measured scattering angle. Okay, so do, do bear that in mind. Um, so this is a diagram which sort of illustrates that a little bit. It's just another picture of, of the same process. Right? These are the additional path lengths that we're having to think about. And we end up with this uh, basic equation up here. Right? The n has been omitted from this equation and commonly you will do something very, very similar. You will make an assumption, unless you have any evidence to the contrary, that n is equal to 1. So what we measure then, x-rays coming in, they're hitting the crystal, they're being deviated by 2 theta to our detector, uh, and we can use that information, given this geometry, to interpret the data that we've got. So here's a, uh, I won't say it's a typical plot, but it's a plot of, of something with a relatively simple structure. Yeah, it's got a cubic structure, this is silicon carbide. Um, and you see what's measured here is 2 theta. Right? Exactly what I was saying before. That's the experimental measurement. Uh, whereas half that is what, what appears in the Bragg equation. Um, so what do I need to draw out of this? I suppose just the experimental point. that To produce a graph like this, essentially what we've done is, you know, we've just drawn little circles on here and added up the intensity as we go out in angle to produce a two-dimensional graph of that sort. Um, so as we go out from the centre of this plate, we're obviously increasing 2 theta. And then we're just measuring how much intensity there is at that given angle, and that's the plot here. Okay, so we have a whole series of bright spots Right, some brighter than others, but nevertheless bright spots. And regions in between where we're getting destructive interference and we're getting very low intensity. Yeah? So experimentally, that's what it looks like. And you will do some of these experiments later in your career here. It can be incredibly complicated. This is a rather historic photograph. Uh, it's data that um, Rosalind Franklin took at King's College in London when she was looking at DNA which then Watson and Crick used to produce their double helix model uh, for DNA. So, you know, you can get an awful lot of information out of what appears to be a relatively complex um, set of data. Okay, now I also mentioned there were non-crystalline materials around in the universe, actually rather a lot of non-crystalline materials, things like window glass, for instance. Uh, and we can do diffraction experiments on them. But they no longer, no longer have this long-range order, remember. There isn't a lattice. We can't talk about ordered layers of atoms in a crystal because we don't have them in an amorphous material like a glass or like a liquid. Um, and we have something intermediate then in our diffraction pattern between the crystal, which is a series of very sharp, well-defined lines, right, like this data set here, uh, and a gas where the atoms are randomly distributed and we get a, quite a featureless pattern. So something in the middle, an amorphous material like a glass, gives us something that's intermediate between the two. <coughs> At larger values of 2 theta, of the pressure <coughs> angle, it becomes asymptotic to a gas-like curve. 
At lower angles, it looks a little bit more like a blurred out version of the diffraction from crystals. All right, now this isn't going to surprise you too much given what I said an amorphous material was. All right, in terms of its local structure, it's driven by basic chemistry. So for silica, which is the example we looked at, we will still have a silicon atom surrounded by four oxygens and an oxygen acting as a bridge between two silicons. Exactly the same uh, for crystal crystalline quartz as it is for an amorphous silica glass. But beyond that, we've lost the repeat unit cell. We don't have a lattice in the glass anymore. And that's what's causing uh, at longer range our, our material just to look basically like a high density gas. We lose that memory, if you will, uh, of the structure. So ignoring the x-axis, which is a slight variant on 2 theta, on this right hand graph, this is diffraction, a diffraction pattern that came, oh this is probably 15 years old, uh, but out of my research group, uh, on these particular titanium doped uh, silicate glasses. And you can see exactly this sort of thing, right? It's been normalized to take out the quadratic underneath, so it's now flat. But it's becoming asymptotic to something featureless. But it's beginning <coughs> by looking like broadened versions of these sharp, uh, sharp peaks. So you can do diffraction on amorphous materials, but you can't analyze it in the same way. No lattice planes, therefore no Bragg equation. <coughs> 